Hello everybody, it's Dr. A. Welcome back to an art appreciation lecture on History Surfer. And today, as you can see from the title image, we'll be talking about Neoclassicism, Romanticism, and Realism. So let's begin by speaking about the Neoclassicists. This era is very much characterized by revolutions, and I mean the Re French Revolution, the American Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, all into the Americas, and it was the Enlightenment that inspired the things that the events that happened. It was an intellectual movement that emphasized the rational. Artists began to question the old conventions they had to adhere to in art, and no longer was one dominant style seen as the trend to follow. The system of patronage also changed dramatically as commercial galleries, private and corporate collectors, and museums replaced the aristocracy and the church. The neoclassical movement, beginning after the French Revolution, was really defined by the fact that the aristocracy, aristocracy excuse me, was defunct. They had been the leading patrons of art in France, and now artists looked to a new source for money. They looked back to Roman classicism occurred as the artists rejected the Baroque style. It was, an, in, in the way they looked at it and perceived it, a new democratic world. The leader of the Romantic, excuse, excuse me, the neoclassicist movement was in France was Jacques-Louis David. He typifies the neoclassical movement of the era and was one of its leaders. His art was political as he ardently supported the revolution. And he actually supported that they sent hundreds of people to their deaths. Eventually he would become Napoleon's painter. David bought into the ideas of the revolution and many of his works glorified the revolutionaries themselves. These people were painting, as I mentioned previously, let me just kind of see if I can't get you a better angle here, there we go, uh, as they, you know, look back towards Rome specifically, but also to Greece, to so the classical era in art history. And so a lot of the themes were classical. The type of style they were doing was very precise, very much about the architectural backgrounds. The themes were classical, and here in this first image you see the Oath of the Herati. They were glorifying the Roman Republic as this new democratic, you know, this, this kind of way to model their new society on. And David certainly followed that agenda by showing things like the death of Socrates, the man who drank hemlock rather than be expelled by, from his beloved city of Athens. They were supporters of the French Revolution. His images of the revolutionaries like Marat glorified their ideals. We see here Marat uh, killed in his bathtub while he was writing for the revolution. Marat himself was not a person to glorify, believe me, but certainly David's image makes us feel that he was a hero for the cause. When a Napoleon came to power, he loved David's work and adopted David as his main artist. We see him here in a self-portrait as he puts his Texas hand into his vest, standing in front of the Egyptian motifs he so loved. Don't forget Napoleon went to Egypt and conquered parts of Egypt. And he made, David made him look like that Roman general, the man on horseback the hero as Napoleon crosses the Alps. These are images that really fed into the regime. And so really I think this is where we see for the first time art becoming almost political in nature. I mean, propaganda, sure, in the Baroque period, but now very much political propaganda. And of course the giant image of Napoleon's coronation. There were 
many people who followed David, and one of them was Angelica Kaufman. Kaufman's uh, images too glorified the past, but she was Swiss and spent most of her life in England. Her father was a painter, and she is considered one of the first women to excel at history painting. She is one of the founding members of the British Royal Academy, and she actually made a living from painting. She was a uh, secretly married to a Swedish nobleman. Her life was kind of scandalous, and turned out to be already married and no nobleman, and not even Swedish. And she had a pretty tumultuous. I, I mean, these events were like. She left him. He ended up kidnapping her and demanding a ransom from her father. So Kaufman went through some things. She finally got rid of him and she was married to a successful painter and they actually moved back to Italy where she finished her career. So, you know, when we talk about people, women, especially like Artemisia Gentileschi and Angelica Kaufman, you have to realize that a lot of the things that happened to them is their lack of agency in this man's world that they inhabited. But she was very, very popular with the British aristocracy. Here's a self-portrait. She does these historical images, as I mentioned before, just as David had done, Virgil writing his own epitaph. But it's when she becomes a well-renowned portrait painter for people like Earl Gower. Here's the family of Earl Gower. And these various nobility that she did images of. This is how she made her living. I mean, if you see these, these are very beautiful, very lovely, and very much admired by her patrons. And so she was quite fortunate in that. In the Americas, Jefferson led the charge to be a follower of some of the ideas of the French Revolution. Although, remember, the American Revolution is first. If you don't know the dates, it's 1776 for the American Revolution, 1789 for the French Revolution. Follow, Jeff Jefferson's an Anglophile. He was an ambassador to France. He loved, not excuse me, not Anglophile, sorry, misspoken, Francophile. And he really did follow the ideas of the French. And so while we don't call it neoclassicism in America, in our in the architecture we see emerge it's called federalism, it is in fact neoclassical. And Monticello is a great example of that. Monticello was a working farm. And Jefferson really bankrupted himself doing this house. If you can see it up in the... Uh, I'll put a ruler up here. Here's the house up here. You can see it in that corner. Uh, bankrupted himself. In fact, they had to float a bond for helping the ex-president bail him out of bankruptcy. He spent so much money. But he did adore the neoclassical look. He followed, he was most influenced by Andrea Palladio's design at the Villa Rotunda. And you can see here, it's got the center, that very strange round room. Again, not an extremely functional building, as the Villa Rotunda was not. Uh, but it is an interesting building. He was quite enigmatic in his choice of, you know, designs and styles. If you look at, for instance, he had a bunch of little gadgets. For instance, see here in the side of the fireplace, if you look on the side there, uh, it was a dumbwaiter that went down to the wine cellar and you could send wine up and down. Here's his study and his somewhat eccentric bedroom. I've always found this very strange. That He was quite tall that he would want to sleep in a place like that. It looks very uncomfortable if you ask me. You can see it there. But it's so he could roll out into his office and do stuff when he's thinking. And here is the room that's under the dome, the rotunda at Monticello. I've added in John Singleton Copley because I'm kind of in, I've always really loved this in this painting and I wanted to put in another uh, American painter. He's uh, really famous 
for his paintings of important figures in colonial New England. Uh, Copley was American painter. He was though active in both colonial America and England. He's Anglo-Irish actually. And I love this image that we're looking at. It is, uh, this one was, I always, I just remember the shark all the time. I always think of the shark when I think of him. It, it was just one to me of his most interesting, Mr. Watson and the shark. That's the, yeah, that's what I'm pretty sure of. Watson and the shark, yeah, no, Mr. And it was, his subject is based on a real person at, who was attacked by a shark while swimming in a Havana Harbor. It, he went on to have a successful career, the young boy who was attacked, he was attacked, he was 14 years old, he lost his leg. And he commissioned this painting as a lesson for the less fortunate. Uh, in fact, it was ended up sitting in his family dining area, or in his office, I think that was the story I heard. I'm sorry, I take that back. But Copley painted uh, people, this was his brother, boy with a squirrel, and, and it painted these famous early Americans, and I love the way his style is almost, it's almost got a surrealist feel to it. It's so super real is really what I'm thinking. It's amazing, but he not only paints famous people, he paints everyday people. Like, we don't know who this is, but we get to see these people from early America. Uh, here's a, one of his famous images, and I love this one. I don't know if you recognize him, the silversmith, uh, the great for, you know, great silversmith who rode his horse crying, the British are coming, the British are coming. And of course, that would be Paul Revere. Isn't that great? Doesn't he look like Jack Black, those of you who are uh, watching this? Think about that. I've always thought that. And my favorite, the portrait of Henry Lawrence. Uh, my students know I love to tell stories to them, and I'll tell you my story about Henry uh, Henry Lawrence's room at the John Rutledge house. I stayed there, and one night while we were there, my husband and I were on the top floor. It was the middle of summer in Charleston, South Carolina. So hot. Lots of summer storms out there. And we just heard a storm start. But then we were the one of the few people staying on the property. Charleston is so hot in the summer. The tourism is just minimal. And we heard footsteps coming up to our door. This is about 5 o'clock in the morning. A giant flash and all the power went out. And we both laid there and waited for the footsteps to get to our door. It came to our front door. And then they turned around and went back downstairs. In the morning, we opened the door. I wouldn't open the door that night. We opened the door to see if there was someone there or someone had left something. There was nothing there. And so that day I asked one of the people who were working at the house, you know, is anybody on our floor? There was no one else staying on our floor. They were like, no. And I said, you know, someone came up to our door last night. And they're like, oh, that's Henry Lauren. Sometimes when people stay in his room, that happens. But I always think of that. But he was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, as was John Rutledge, the owner of the house. The Romantic Movement followed after the neoclassicism. So here we go. Here's a phenomena of the modern period will have multiple movements happening simultaneously. And the Romantics were in opposition to the neoclassical movement because they were more concerned with feelings and emotions. They concentrated on exotic subjects from literature and common everyday themes. They had a more painterly technique. Eugene Delacroix was the ro leading Romantic painter in France and he questioned the goodness of the work done by Academy painters. You know, he questioned uh, what was, wasn't art supposed to be in rebellion to the norm? And he himself believed in the revolutionary spirit. Eugene Delacroix's painting show that very painterly technique that they were so fond of the bark of Dante here, and of course his most famous piece, Liberty Leading the People. But this is iconic, 
you know, of the era, we see the statue, the, excuse me, the figure of liberty. She represents freedom and she's leading the people on their way to their new life. In England, the romantic painters were increasingly affected by the onslaught of the changes caused to the environment by the Industrial Revolution. They opposed the Industrial Revolution. So they weren't having a political revolution like France was. France experienced a number of small revolutions before stability took hold. But they were really opposing those forces which were desecrating nature. Constable especially became more acutely conscious of weather as a continuous phenomena. It was altering the appearance of the landscape. He became indeed more aware of the changes in nature as in a whole. He took an intense look at clouds between 1820 and 21 and 22, and he did all of these clouds sketches. If you look closely at his images, like here Salisbury Cathedral, you'll see this dark cloud. Well, that's from factories. And of course, the nostalgia for what life used to be, the pristine quality of the past. In America, Robert Duncanson Robert S. Duncanson, sorry, was a landscape and portrait painter who was influenced by the Romantics. He was born in northern New York in 1817, and his father was Scottish and his mother was of mixed race. Robert was technically born free due to manumissions law, but he was one of the earliest African recognized African American painters in the New World. In order to ensure his education, Robert's father took him to Canada for his schooling, and he returned in the early 1840s to live in Ohio with his mother, right outside of Cincinnati. In about 1842, 25-year-old Doug Hansen's work was being shown in Cincinnati, and although he was really self-taught in his early techniques, we see that he was greatly influenced by the Hudson River School of Painters. Uh, he was well-traveled and painted in places such as Detroit and North Carolina. He also painted trip scenes from his trips to Europe, and he took trips all over the place. I mean, he was quite fortunate. There's some evidence that, to believe that his trips to Europe were funded by the Anti-Slavery League as well as the Freedmen's Aid Bureau. Unfortunately, after his successful shows in Cincinnati. He died in Detroit on December 21st, 1872, at the age of 55. Uh, Duncanson's work shows his interest in travel and his interest in this kind of romanticizing the world. Uh, here he's in Italy. He did make a trip to Vesu near Vesuvius to Pompeii. And here you can see his most, one of his early images of the beautiful landscape of the unspoiled world. But like the British Romantics, Duncanson was realizing the effect of uh, the pollution, you know, and so he's kind of documenting the beautiful, I mean, look at that. It's just a beautiful, really beautiful image. Uh, this is his most famous image blue hole little miami river and then we also have this view of cincinnati from covington kentucky and done in 1851 and you can see that smoke from all the industrialization following the romantics we have another separate movement emerge and there's many i mean these are going to be they're going to proliferate as we get deeper into the 19th century because that's where we are uh, we see the emergence of one of the most controversial painters of the time, and that was Manet. His controversial Olympia and Luncheon on the Grass are probably the most recognizable images of, of the period. Uh, they're offensive to a lot of people of that 
era in France because he challenged so many of the ideas of the past. He was interested in Japanese art and the flattening of the surface so we no longer see this kind of reliance on the idea of modeling and making things look so fleshy. If you look at his Olympia, one of his more controversial images, you can see that uh, the tonal quality is somewhat flat. And that heavy outline around her body, it's offensive to many of the people of the period. I don't know if you can see it here. There's this black cat. I know it's hard to see when I'm projecting like this and recording, but there is. And this is a an image, the tongue-in-cheek for a, a bad woman. And she's a prostitute. It was and she was not even ashamed. Look at the look of her face. You know, she's just very much staring out at the viewer with no shame. But Luncheon in the Grass did so many things that so many people didn't like. Uh, the way the woman stares out at the viewer. The fact that it's not about anything. There's no grand narrative here. How flat it was. And, you know, this positioning of a essentially a still life why and so a lot of things did not go over well people did not like a lot of the things that Monet had done here but he's setting the way for the future which is going to be impressionism uh, he's a huge influence on the impressionist Rosa Bonheur was another of the realist painters she was a woman who uh, had a harder, of course, harder time getting into this school. She became a school of art, sorry. She became, becomes more famous in Britain and America than her own country. She's a celebrated painter of animals. In this image here, we see the Horse Fair, 1853, one of her most famous images. Rosa was controversial. I mean, she, she lived controversial. She studied with her father early in his life, and she studied animal anatomy. She was interested in it, and she adopted male attire for its greater conven convenience, and doing the job that she did, which was go out and look at you know, people working with animals and animals themselves. Um, one of her most image, famous images is her pla the plowing in the fields here of France. Look at how that's, you know, so very real. It's, 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 it's almost as if she used a camera. I don't know if she used a camera to do studies at, but certainly her images of horses and cattle are just all the rage in England and the Americas. She did pets images. She was a triumph. Absolutely. She did a triumphal tour of England and Scotland. And she actually was befriended by Queen Victoria. So, I mean, people appreciated the job she did, but she felt like, you know, she was not fitting in. And so this is one of the ways she took so she could have more freedom. Uh, Rosa's images are still interesting to people because of the approach she took in her painting. And you can see it's it's definitely not something that we would have ever seen like, say, in a Baroque painter's work. This seems like such a mundane topic. Monet, too. I mean, they just people just didn't understand what these people were doing. And last but not least, we're going to talk about Henry Osawa Tanner. He was the son of a minister. Tanner was raised in an affluent, well-educated African-American family. His family was reluctant to allow him to become a uh, painter. It didn't seem very worthy. But in 1879, Tanner enrolled in the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. And there he came, comes under the influence of Thomas Eakins. And in 1889, he went to Atlanta and had an unsuccessful attempt to support himself as an artist. So it's really, this he's, he's really struggling when he moves to Paris in 1891. He turns his 
interest to genre subjects of eight in uh, 1893 returns to the United States from Paris of his own race and his most celebrated image is the banjo le lesson. In this image Tanner tackles the stereotype um, of African American males who didn't have any nurturing side to them. The, dan the banjo itself is a symbol of African American culture and so he challenges all kinds of stereotypes here when we see this older man lovingly enveloping this little boy as he instructs him. And it's in this banjo lesson that really we see Tanner shine. He does hear the thankful poor. Eventually he will abandon these kind of images when he moves back to Paris and in 1895 and there he becomes a salon artist and religious painter. Unfortunately never again painted genre scenes of African Americans. But he does set the tone for the African American emergence and the community to begin to have established artists in the Americas. That's all for today everyone. I hope you enjoyed these, this lecture and I will see you next time. Have a great day. Peace out. Dr. A.